So welcome Naya, it's a pleasure to speak to you again. In, you know, it was my privilege, it's, it's not been a month yet and to do it again uh, and here at E4M. Uh, can you request people to move back again because I think there was a gap. So, uh, he has already introduced you and we all know that you're doing extremely well. So, I wanted to understand how did this idea of starting Baby Chakra come to you and uh, what were some of the initial challenges when you started it? So, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here um, and thank you for having me. Um, I know it's been a packed day from what I hear, so it's, it's going to be exciting to meet some of, uh, some of you offline as well. Um, you know, so Baby Chakra started in 2015, Nazia, and the premise was fairly simple when I think about it now. Uh, but the premise was how do you help parents, specifically mothers, make the best choices through pregnancy and parenting um, in a very personalized way, right? Because every parent, every mother goes through a very different journey. And I think the insight, the two insights we built off uh, were from my time at McKinsey when I was working in healthcare. The first insight was that people learn best from other people. They learn best from peers. So how do you create, you know, at scale, digital first peer-to-peer -peer communities of care? And the second insight was you need experts intervening at critical junctures in almost a surrendipitious matter, manner. Like you don't even know you need an expert's help or doctor's help at a certain point in time. And if you can have the expert step in at that point in time, it just adds tremendous value to the healthcare outcomes. So I think that's really what Baby Chakra was built on, the two premises of personalized care journeys of pregnancy and parenting and communities for mothers. I think the two challenges I faced starting off, one was, you know, we started in 2015, right? This is pre-geo, this is pre the advent of smartphones. So I think the scaling process of getting mothers at scale up front uh, was, a very, uh, was a very interesting one. And we did a lot of growth hacks to actually crack that model. The second, uh, uh, the second sort of challenge, I would say, was the challenge of building trust, right? Uh, because you're building in a very high trust space, you're building for mothers, you're building for families, you're telling them and advising them and working with them on how to take care of themselves through pregnancy and through childcare, right? Highly critical points in time. So building trust early on as a young brand was super challenging. And I think communities helped us crack that in a very big way. Uh, Naya, you know, when you're building a community, uh, finance is also one of the aspects and you eventually monetized it, you launched products and all. So, but uh, how do you make your content look very authentic and very credible when you are simultaneously monetizing it and building a business? So, you know, I, I fully agree, by the way. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that content community platforms have faced, right? Uh, creator platforms as well, because the margins are not as much. But I think the one thing that really helped us was that, um, see, credibility was never an issue, Nazia, right? Because credibility came from social proof. When someone is going on a platform and they're seeing millions of UGC, right, around certain themes, topics, or even product reviews and recommendations, you can't be wrong with, you know, hundreds of thousands of voices, and these are clearly not paid voices, right? These are not influencers, these are real people. Right? They have real journeys. When you click and see people's profiles, you see they've had a journey of interaction on the community, which is not to do with products or not to do with like a certain point of view or being paid for it. So I think that really helped us build credibility and a very strong brand voice for whatever was on Baby Chakra. I think the second thing that really helped us build credibility was the more no's we said. So of course, brands came to us and still come to us to work for them and with them in amplifying their campaigns or amplifying brand launches or product launches, etc. right? But I think what really has helped us in good stead is many times we've said no to brands when it does not meet our philosophy of being in service of mothers, right? I'll give you an example, a gripe water brand, right? Our experts have multiple times told us that gripe water has a certain amount of alcohol and it's not the right solution to give your child in times of colic. So we've had these brands approach us and we've said no. And I think, you know, as brands, the more no's we say, the stronger your brand proposition, stronger your brand trust becomes. So I think these are the two things. One, social proof, which is actually created by our users in hundreds of millions of UGC. And secondly, saying no, very, very, um, I think, confidently as a brand and, you know, sort of living with the repercussions of it and being comfortable with that. Naya, I was reading you one of your recent interviews where you said that, you know, you were able to uh, 
achieve lower consumer acquisition cost, which is very important, you know, to increase profitability margins. How did you do that? If you can explain us more about, and you've done it through content, right? How did you do it? You know, the journey's been very interesting. So we've had two parallel journeys and now we've sort of seen it converge. One journey has played out with MyGlam and PopXO, right? So when those two brands came together and that was the first, I think the first part of the Good Glam group, right? And my two co-founders, Priyanka and Darpan came together at that point in time. Um, they found the whole content to commerce journey, um, you know, because content had a very large top of funnel, as we all know. And when you integrate product conversations and product branding and product launches and even like experiences in those, in the content pieces, uh, you know, the cost of conversion and the cost of uh, customer acquisition actually came down to less than half a dollar for my glam at that point in time, right? A similar journey we've seen play out with communities. So we were seeing a parallel track and that's why when Darpan and I charted first, it made sense for the three of us to come together. Because you know, there was of course content, there was commerce and there was community. And with community what we were seeing, and we'd already done this with brands, including for ourselves, right? We were seeing two things, right? One is the power of amplifying conversations that community can do, right? So as if when you're building on a brand, you want the conversation around the brand to be at multiple touch points and in, at scale. Right? So with communities, you can do that. Even today, we do all the you know, good community, the product launches through the good community stack. Right? And that has helped bring our cost of digital amplification and offline amplification to, I think, one of the most compelling CPR rates in the, in the country. Right? And the second thing that we've realized with, uh, with uh, conversions is also using these conversations in all of our marketing uh, CRM um, journeys. Right? which has helped us upsell, cross-sell using real people's reviews, experiences, you know, application of visuals, right, of application of lipsticks or, you know, hair care products, etc. And using those in CRM communications, we've seen a very strong uptick on using real people's pictures, real people's reviews, real community members' experiences actually play in driving conversions. So I think these are the two things, you know, embedding our products, embedding our launches in content, and number two, using real UGC and real uh, experiences and testimonials in, of course, our amplification campaigns, but also in our conversion campaigns. So, you know, in 2015, starting from Mamas, now you, in 2020, you moved on to the entire women community by joining the good glam world. So, uh, tell us about your role there and uh, how, what expertise do you bring to the table? So I am the co-founder, so the three of us basically sit and plot on how to think about building in India, for India and for the world. I think that's really the first part of what I do day in, day out. The second part of what I do is, uh, you know, the last 18 to 24 months has been a very, um, literally a very frantic and a very hectic period for all three of us because we've been acquiring a bunch of amazing companies and we've had the privilege of partnering with some amazing founders. And this has been across the spectrum, right? So we acquired product brands. So we acquired the Mom's Course, you know, Sirona Hygiene, Organic Harvest. Miss Malini. Miss, uh, so that's in the media assets. I'll come to that. Uh, Saint Botanica. Um, so we've acquired a bunch of brands there. Then we've acquired, uh, to your point, on the media side, we acquired Scoop Whoop, Miss Malini, and Tweak. Uh, and then Creator, we create the whole good creator ecosystem, which is our influencer management vertical. And, you know, we acquired Bull Bull, Viduli, Winkle. And the fourth thing that we just set up about two, three months back is the Good Communities, which is the world's largest deep interest, hyper-localized communities of women, right? Which I'm again, the third thing that I'm doing is personally leading that. So I think these are the three things we've looked at. One has been about like, where is the group going in terms of everything from international to fundraising? And you know, we kind of divide and conquer that piece to it. The second is how do we sort of, you know, make these acquisitions, how do they fit in a strategy, negotiating with the founders, and then of course the integration process itself. And the third is setting up a new vertical of good community. The fourth thing that of course I've been doing and now it's transitioning to the, the brands team has been building out Baby Chakra from a, from a, like a really like no sales product brand to being today the fastest growing baby brand. Um, product brand um, across marketplaces in India. Now that has transitioned and now will become part of our parenting vertical overall. So you will actually see it a lot more, you know, focus now and, and a lot more visible even offline and in multiple other uh, avenues as well. So you're also a media company, you're also a product company and then you're also into acquiring a lot of smaller companies. So how do you, how do you define this group? 
you know so i think we say this right we are a digital first fmcg conglomerate okay you know and i think the reality is that the way fmcg or the way personal can beauty was built and it was built over decades over centuries in the past that time span has been shortened exponentially because of the power of digital and you know i think it goes back to all of these points right how do you build consideration you build it through conversations you build it through content right how do you build trust you build it through conversations among experts and peers right how do you build conversions right you build it through again communications at multiple touch points which are relevant personalized and almost intuitive that how did you know i needed this product when i did not know it myself and that's through the power of digital that's through the power of data that's through the power of all that we all the assets we have today this is in fact my next question how do you what are the challenges of building an interactive experience you know which is which also gives uh, takes care of brand safety and is you know is so touching like the the way the, the kind of things you've done in past so and you've not just just done it once with baby chakra then you've done it again with good glam group so how you know in general how would you explain that you know how to build an interactive experience a good interactive experience so you know i mean you think about where the consumer is and where your uh, community member is rather right we think about our consumers as almost as community members um and we have about 20 million of them right um and the way we think about it is that they live online offline and we have to mimic that behavior and be with them on that journey and i'll give you two examples right um so we did an experiment not an, we actually invested in big boss and of course uh, uh, coffee with karan um and we were the sponsors there and you know what we did there was a very differentiated format this time around so you know we ran of course we had a you know my glam experience zone and coffee with karan had the interstitials running through the but we also on our app and offline ran contests for our community members to basically see by while they were looking at you know the, the the you know the program and they were looking at you know hearing like let's say karan talking about a certain theme or an aspect how could you vote on what they felt about it on the my glam app on the community section right or on big boss when you're looking at voting in and out contestants or supporting contestants right doing that on the community section of the my glam app right so i think we were trying to bridge that that was first the second thing we did was you know when as and when people would get evicted from the big boss house right we'd actually host offline meetups for our community members to interact with them and understand their experiences in the big back in the big boss house and also through that entire setup really get exposed to our product portfolio too right so we were constantly sort of you know when if you take a consumer and you're trying to you know kind of create a very a uh, beautiful thread of omni channel touch points with that consumer you know peppered with digital peppered with you know community peppered with of course you know uh, ott right it was a very beautiful cycle we see play out and i think that of course has led to a certain set of outcomes that we were tracking in terms of you know brand mentions in terms of brand recognition in terms of brand trust um you know also in terms of of course our outcomes um so we are now the fastest and the large one of the largest uh, makeup and you know beauty brands in india and you know we will be the largest in the next uh, year you also associated with a lot of celebrities last year you know akshay khanna and then shraddha kapoor sonam kapoor also so uh, but initially when you started you were only on digital right when did this transformation happen when did you decide to go traditional and you know advertise on television rope in brand ambassadors when did this happen so we've been very fortunate i think uh, we've had uh, so there are of course two kind of sort of brand agreements that we have with our celebrities right one is that it's a typical like you know a a, a celebrity um, arrangement where you you know give some money and that's it but i think the what we've been very fortunate at the group has been that we've actually had people invest in us so the uh, you know the we recently all three of them are investors not right? all three but um, uh, shraddha is an investor akshay recently signed a jv with us uh, and we're going to be launching together a brand of male uh, you know products. nutran products yeah. right personal care products which is super exciting because he really is passionate about and has been sort of the spokesperson for this space for ever right so we couldn't think of a better partner on this one and we're going to be announcing a few more very exciting actually uh, updates on the celebrity um, investments front in the glam group as well very soon stay tuned nazia uh, so i think what we found is a lot of um, lot of uh, partnership 
from celebrities in, in, in the group. And you know, by the way, it started off with Manish Malhotra, interestingly enough. Okay. So many years back, Manish and My Glam partnered to bring out a range of makeup, the Manish Malhotra by My Glam range of makeup. And that has been incredibly successful, right? So I think that history of having partnerships with Bollywood and with celebrities in general goes back a long way. But every time it takes on a form of them actually working with us as partners versus only as endorsement deals. Tell us more about your recent initiative of tying up with WhatsApp to build good communities and how does it work? So that's the fourth stack or the fourth vertical of the group. It's a big bet we've taken at the group. Uh, we have access to more than 20 million uh, community consumers, right, across the group. And the way it's structured is that the good communities, the belief, right, is that communities are the future of the internet. You know, and I think that's established globally. Brands get it now, right? They struggle to make communities, though. Um, now, building off the experience and the learnings we had building with Baby Chakra, um, how do we now build communities, and that's what we're doing, across interests and brands and localities. So what we've done is we've said, okay, beauty is a deep interest for women, right? And My Glam is a beautiful brand that fits into the beauty deep interest. So we've created a community which is going to be one of the largest community of beauty deep interest women called the Glam Fam. We have women who are very interested in mental, intimate, sexual health, right? Talking about PCOS, talking about periods, right? Again, very aligned with Sirona, which is, you know, the largest seller of menstrual cups in the country today, one of our portfolio companies. So we have the Sirona circle. Of course, we have the mom stars because we have a deep interest of, you know, mothers already existing, thanks to Baby Chakra, but now Momsco is also one of our portfolio brands, right? So Mom stars is the other community. And the fourth community is the organic squad because one of our brands is Organic Harvest. A lot of belief and a lot of purpose, a lot of mission around sustainability, holistic living, uh, organic care and skin care, hair care, etc., right? So we have a, a large community of folks who are passionate and almost rabid about in, incorporating organic in their way of life, and that's the organic squad community. So that is a deep interest community. Now, these communities exist on our app, on WhatsApp, and of course on MWeb and offline, right? So they meet and we have them hyper-locally mapped. So it's not just saying, okay, they exist in India, right? You can literally say these many organic squad members exist in, let's say, Parel in Bombay. Okay. Um, so I think what WhatsApp has helped so us do... Every PIN code will have a separate yeah. Or community? Yeah. So we have we've mapped it down to that level. But of course, what we do is we keep it at a city-wide level when it comes to engagements, right? Now, what WhatsApp has helped us do is that, you know, you have to be, again, like my, the whole premise that we talked about earlier is you have to be where the consumer is, right? WhatsApp is where our consumers are. Uh, they're already engaging with us as brands there, right? So we've actually worked very closely with WhatsApp India. Uh, and we're working now with the WhatsApp product team in the US to really create differentiated propositions through WhatsApp communities as a stack. And then, of course, within that, the WhatsApp groups ecosystem. And we're using that as one of our most powerful ways of forming deep engagement and very high trust communities uh, across the country. And what exactly do you plan to achieve? So what you're already achieving, actually, <laughs> Nazia, is you're achieving three things, right? One, we're achieving a lot of lift in our brand amplifications, right? You know, if you remember what I just shared in the beginning, right? How do you get hundreds of, mil like hundreds of thousands of people sharing millions of content pieces, right? On social, across WhatsApp groups that they belong to, which are not part of our ecosystem, but other WhatsApp groups they're part of, right? Or even just talking about it. You know, peer-to-peer -peer recommendations form 82% of conversion decisions still whatever said and done. So how do you use your existing community members to basically talk to them, but also talk with them about what matters to them and have them eventually become evangelists of your products and of your brand and your brand purpose. So we're already seeing it play out. We track social mentions, we track shares, we track, you know, um, very high converting conversations and we do it across geographies and we see which ones are performing better across which communities, right? And how that impacts our sales of brands, right? So that's one piece. The second thing that we track already is the referrals. So, of course, you have your existing customers, but the beauty of having a community is because they all become evangelists for you, they actually invite other people to come and join that community, that purpose, right? So, again, that leads to a cost of customer acquisition. It's, it's 
rapidly dropped, right? So I think that's the other piece that we've really grown into a very scientific growth funnel using communities. And the third is basically co-creating with our communities, right? Again, something we learned from Baby Chakra. You know, when we launched the Baby Chakra products, we didn't really have much money. Uh, but our products overnight became best sellers on marketplaces because our communities who we had co-created literally down to doing FGDs with them virtually saying, you know, what price should we launch this product at? What should the front of pack, back of pack look like? What ingredients sound best to you to really highlight on? What is the, you know, even the write-up on the back of pack, right? Kya likna chahiye? Running it by doctors, running it by mothers at scale. What color should we use? What kind of packaging formats? Everything. You're co-creating with our communities. Even when we would send samples, like five samples of the same product, and we'd say, which one do you like? If it did not meet a 98% you know, uh, alignment with community saying, ye launch kare at this price point, we would not launch it. Okay. So I think the whole co-creation process is an extremely compelling one. And today we are co-creating with more than 700,000 customers on a monthly basis, community members on a monthly basis. So Naya, you yourself said that marketers have understood now that communities, building communities is the future, you know, where the brands should go. So if you have to give advice to people, you know, who are trying to build communities, who's, anyone who's interested in building in this kind of an interactive community, what would that be? So I, I'd say that, uh, you know, when you're building a community, I think there's two things to keep in mind. Uh, you know, community building does not come as easily because it is both an art and a science, right? And I think uh, a lot of people look at the art and they look at the science and it's only when you get someone who really gets both of it and comes together and then of course powers it with what is the art part of it and what is the science I, part of it? I'll let you break it down, sure, happy to. So, so the art is basically community, you have to put others before yourself, right? So as a brand, you can't keep on saying, oh, mere brand ki suno, right? The whole purpose of building a community is that, listen, we want, we want to build with you. We are together building out our brands or we're together building out a brand purpose. Right? So, for instance, with My Glam, you know, earlier the whole conversation was always about buy our products, our lipstick is the best, it's long staying, these are like 100 shades we have, right? It's now moved to saying, listen, we are a brand that stands for inclusive beauty, right? We are a brand that respects your choices. We want to be a partner with you in your journey of confidence, right? And we have amazing stories come up about how a woman, like, who's probably, like, not, you know, being allowed to venture out of a house and take a job, but when she wears her kajal and her red lipstick, she feels that she can take on the world, right? And she's like, I can do anything I put my mind to, right? So, I mean, those are the conversations we need to have as brands with, with our community members and put their needs first, right? And be very empathetic. That's an art. It does not come naturally because we're in a very sales, bechna hai, bechna hai, bechna hai cycle and that's reality, right? So, I think you need someone who understands the art and you need someone who understands the science, which is, okay, what are we really tracking? What is success of community? Right? Because you get too artsy, then the problem is that how are you like building a business of community, right? So then you basically go back to saying, okay, what are the brand's uh, goals for this month? What are the new launches we are doing this quarter, right? What are the lifts they want to see in brand conversations, brand mentions, right? How do we then work backwards from that and basically bring out a very high conversion a community engagement plan that basically helps achieve the brand goals, right? And also keeps the community healthy. So there's a couple of metrics we track internally on a daily basis, pretty much an hourly basis, right? That helps us be on track on that. And then the pillar below is that of technology. And, they, and you know, like it has to be that, right? So on our app, deep interest happens because, you know, we have a very large data stack uh, and a lot of work happening from our data science team that basically helps you predict what interests a person would have, not just with beauty, but within beauty. K beauty, hair, skin, new forms of makeup, work makeup, party makeup, wedding makeup, like, you know, that entire stack and helps us predict and create a very strong predictive analysis model, right? And then get more and more recommendations happen organically from users, from experts, of products, of experiences, of suggestions and inspiration. So I think this triumvirate, not easy to build, but when it gets built, there's a lot of magic that can happen. And I think it really gives you a moat that is very difficult to break. Very beautifully explained. Right, really. And, and I'm assuming you're good at both art and science. I'm learning both. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we can now open to the audiences if anyone has a question for Anaya. Oh, I see a couple of hands. Uh, Do we have a mic right there? You can take this mic. I'll, I'll pass it on. Thank you. Hi, Anaya. 
quick two questions. Uh, you spoke about collaborating with WhatsApp. So uh, I just wanted to understand what would be the strategy to have an end-to-end -end, uh, shopping experience, the UX for the consumers. Uh, is it happening or how is it? I mean, is it in the States? And the second question would be, the cosmetic industry is facing a challenge of counterfeit products in the Indian market. You know, how does a brand like you uh, tackle it and what would be your advice to the consumers for this? Sure. So the first one in terms of the shopping experience on WhatsApp, right? So right now we've kept our communities a bit disjunct from the shopping experience, right? So what we do is we, we haven't integrated shopping in the community stack yet. That is something that we are planning a few quarters from now. But what we do track are the other metrics, right? So basically we do reviews, referrals, and then we of course have links that basically link back to the um, app or PDP pages or the MWeb PDP pages, the case may be. So we track the referral sales from that today, we have a natively integrated shopping, right? Because you want to, we're, we're still building out a lot of uh, brand trust and brand love through the community stack there. A quick answer to your question there. But in the pipeline. Uh, I think on the second of the counterfeit products, I think as an industry, not just beauty, and uh, not just beauty, right? But I think across D2C in general, uh, and I'm part of many founder groups, right? We are really coming down strong on counterfeit products. We're getting a lot of help now from our marketplace partners, fortunately, right? And I think uh, what we've all done, I think not just at Good, the Good Glam Group, but I think across founders, across the industry, is literally not tolerate any counterfeiting, right? And that means really working hard with our lawyers and our legal teams to ensure that this is, you know, pretty much nipped at the bud and working very closely with our partner market, marketplace partners, right? Amazon, Flip, uh, Flipkart, um, you know, Nike in some cases, but that's less over there to really ensure that the sellers over there are really, um, you know, clearly, very, very clearly told. And, you know, I think now because we've come together as founders, we have a lot more say uh, versus working in isolated patches. If so you can uh, say it on question. the mic. That's a great question. So you're saying, how do you make consumers aware? Yeah, exactly. Right? I think that's a great question. I think there's a lot of work to be done there still. We've been having internal discussions about this as well. Um, you know, there have been a lot of conversations happening about, even like, for instance, with uh, protein supplements, right? How to distinguish a fake product from a genuine product. So we're trying to do the same sort of awareness building campaigns with our communities uh, today. And that's a conversation, an ongoing conversation we're having with our brands team. Uh, but I think the whole idea today is to basically, like, literally take no hostages. Like, literally not have this uh, happen in the first place as much as possible and be very, very clear that our legal teams will be on you if you, uh, if you go down this route. But I think it's a great point. I think it's something we want to accelerate, for sure. So, Naya, um, I want to ask you as an expert who has built communities. So, I have always been uh, in a confusion whether to follow my art or whether to go behind the signs. And, you know, I have always been a victim of algorithm. I'm still trying to understand. So, as someone who has been there in the, you know, industry and built so many communities out there, what would be your advice to a, you know, just a budding content creator or someone who's, who's an artist but still making into the content space? Uh, I think there's a lot of authenticity that, uh, you know, requires neither art or science, it just requires you to be you. <laughs> I think a starting point is, and I think with communities, you have to start small. Um, and then, you know, I think the important thing, uh, I, I think the three important things I would leave with you and see if it, if it resonates, right? One is, what do you stand for? What is your purpose and what is your mission? I think being very, very defined about that from being a community builder and to building out a community accordingly. I think that you need to nail down very clearly. The second is, what do you not stand for? You know, for instance, we do not stand for, you know, being judgmental or for hate speech or even for, unfortunately today, men being part of the women's communities, right? Because you've seen that player. Yeah. So what do you not stand for? And being extremely protective and anal about ensuring that your community experience, whatever you're creating, wherever you're commuting, actually speaks that and lives that, right? I think the third is finding your early evangelists and believers. Right? And spending a lot of time with them one-on-one -on -one and learning from them and learning with them and make them understand that you're co-creating the community with them. Right? I think many times, you know, with the Instagram and with the social media phenomenon, it's always been an audience. It's not been communities. Now, communities work when you're actually working and building that experience and going back to that purpose of the community, right? With the people that you're building out as part of the community. I think that's when you find extreme retention, love, uh, engagement, and then the referral, right? Which then leads to your growth spark. But a lot of, I think, non-scalable uh, conversations, a lot of non-scalable inciting 
that you have to do with your early community members and then really define your purpose to them constantly. So they are, you understand if they are part of your mission uh, in that case. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Naya, I have a question. So you did bring about a very pertinent topic about building communities and staying in touch with your uh, end customers. But for a product to be successful, communities is one route and uh, the channel is another route, right? And for a lot of products to be successful, the channel also needs to be very penetrative, right? So how, what are your thoughts on striking that balance between building communities at one way and then going down building, the, uh, building strong channels as well? Oh, that's a great question. You know, what we try to do is actually work on the existing channels and build our communities on those channels, right? So, I mean, of course, um, one way to think about it is that we are on, so if you go to the MyGlam app today, um, the app is the app. It was an e-commerce app before, right? But there is the fourth, bo on the bottom nav bar, the fourth tab is actually communities, the Glam fam, right? And what we are seeing there is direct journeys from community to commerce. I mean, there's no friction, right? Because if you're creating engagement there, two things happen, right? The app metrics go up, the retention, engagement, referral, time spent, AOV, everything goes up, right? Uplift, cross set, everything goes up because you have a very engaged community there. The second is when someone is discovering products on the community or people have joined the app to be on the community versus coming with a buying purchase uh, behavior mindset, right? They discover other products or inspiration. So why do communities happen, right? They come to either connect, with like-minded people, right? In this case, beauty or whatever, parenting, whatever the case might be. Number two, to get inspired. You know, how to live your life better. That's a very inherent human need, right? So communities form on that. So you see a lot of inspiration from experts or like, you know, art, makeup artists or women like you, right? The third is to learn. You know, we have a lot of women who are trying to learn basics of makeup, right? So then we do workshops, virtual, digital, through our community members, through our in-store makeup artists, through our makeup trainers, etc. on the My Glam app. I'll give you one example, right? And the fourth is to basically, you know, either like get the best out of it, right? So it could be like through earning or could be through contests or through any gamification, you know. So if you can fill those four purposes on that community experience, right, on a channel, that's our own channel, it's, it's magical, you know. Offline, obviously, what we're trying to do there is that, you know, we do this uh, hybrid model. So we'll do a lot of workshopping in stores that we have. Right? So people actually come in to experience workshops or to learn something new. So it goes back to that, you know, that learning experience, the connecting experience. And then from there, they basically walk into our stores, they walk into our partner stores like a shoppers, etc. And then they experience the environment, they experience our products, we give them mini kits, they try it on with our makeup artists, they try it on with peers, peers, they talk about the experience, you know, being part of a beauty community. And then that leads to greater evangelism, word of mouth and conversions at that point of sale. So we're trying to build on channels as much as possible. Uh, so, we don't want to keep them disjunct. We have a question coming here from the second table and we'll come to you as well. Hi, thank you so much for this insightful session. I think uh, the marketer and me just got very excited listening to this. Uh, just one question, you mentioned about WhatsApp communities and you mentioned something about WhatsApp in the US. Uh, is there something that is, uh, I'm specifically asking because I belong to a global community in that sense. It's a very fragmented market. If I have to look at South Asians there and if I were an Indian, OTT platform, is there any learnings when the markets are so fragmented of how you should go about building a community? So what I was actually talking about, and thank you for being excited, I'm too, I'm very excited about what you're building here at the group, so thank you. I think, uh, you know, with what I was talking about with WhatsApp was actually, you know, because we are, actually we are, um, yeah, globally we are the largest brand communities play. So I think we're working very closely with the WhatsApp product team in the US because they are learning a lot from our experiences building and you know there's so much need and we are also obviously you know sharing with them because we want the WhatsApp platform to be better and more attuned to building out communities even at further scale right. So even simple things like admin tools like you know the fact that communities which is a new product launch for them how, do, how does that scale without crashing or without having a suboptimal experience is communities have groups right how do you manage you know all the admin rights how do you manage group interconnections how do you so much, right? Planting of, you know, uh, prompts. There are no, like, per se bots. There are no so analytics today, right, on WhatsApp groups. So we're, like, working with third-party tools, which are currently a bit suboptimal. So we're giving all this feedback back to the WhatsApp product team. And, you know, um, I, I want to do, I do, I do want to share this. Um, I think sometimes we just think about these platforms as, um, as behemoths. And, you know, we, there's so much to be gained from some of these conversations. I'll give you an example, right? Long back, this is 2015, 2016, Nazia. We had, Baby Chakra was a different avatar, right? We had 
uh, we were building out a services discovery play for parenting, right? So imagine Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, uh, Chennai, all the pediatricians, daycares, play schools, activity centers. What we were struggling with, we were listing them out hyper locally. We were struggling with getting reviews. So we'd gotten about 25, 30,000 reviews and we were like, but to be really meaningful in this construct, we need to be having millions of reviews. And I remember this very serendipitous conversation I had with a, WhatsApp, with a Facebook team, that time Facebook pages team, the product team, when I was in uh, visiting the US uh, for a meeting with someone there, but F8. And I said, listen, can you give us like exclusive access to basically populate with Facebook page reviews? <coughs> Do you remember at that point in time, Facebook pages had these services and they'd see all the reviews. So we were the only company globally to have access to that. And our entire services section was suddenly through that one, one like conversation and of course multiple follow-ups of the tech team there. But through that one integration, we had hundreds of thousands of reviews populate our, um, our review sections for our services across our six cities overnight. You know, and I think that's where sometimes as, you know, brand owners, business owners, marketeers, I think the partnerships in tech play a super critical role even more than what we'd imagine. You know, with fragmented groups, I think it goes back to what I was telling the earlier, uh, answering on the earlier question. I think you have to start with cohorts always. You know, because um, I'm, I've been chatting with a friend who's building something out for senior citizens today in India, right? I mean, it's giving you a proxy. And I think uh, you have to basically say, can I, can I figure out my first set of cohort, right, uh, for this demographic and then build for them because I, I don't think the answer is always, I think localization plays, depending on what you're talking about and what you're trying to solve for, right, but localization plays a very, very important role in setting that experience and setting that brand credibility. So I think we can't ignore localization. So if there is a fragmentation that's happening, it probably exists for a reason. Uh, and especially if it's geographically defined, right? So I think we have to respect that and build with that in mind. Thank you very much. We're already, we are all eight, nine minutes up. <laughs> and uh, Naya, we really enjoyed this conversation and you can see the kind of response you got. So people had so many questions to ask and we wish you all the best for future. Keep building communities, keep us engaged, keep uh, uh, launching good products for our children and for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nazia. Thank you so much.